the value of a certain kind of thing, and how that object, coming to class or action, fits into a view about what makes a life good. Maybe having lots of money makes a life good. Maybe having lots of money is only valuable because it can buy you other things that makes life good. Maybe education is itself part of what makes a life good. Okay, so this is the approach that was dominant for 1,500, more than 1,500, 2,000 years. Investigation of what is valuable by tying values, by tying good things to the nature of um, the good life for humans. And so on this picture, we get a dominant inclusive end. Dominant, the, the dominant inclusive end is a good life. It's dominant because all of the other values feed into this highest good. It's inclusive because it may include different things. It may include feelings of pleasure, satisfaction. It may include education. It may include other components. So there's no assumption that there's just one uniform thing that makes life good. Okay, so this idea of the good as something which is a dominant, inclusive end is going to structure rationality. It's going to structure our assessment of value. If you act in a way that contributes to achieving this goal, you're acting rationally. You're acting in a way that's good. You're acting in a way that promotes what's valuable. Um, and the status of this highest good, the status of this dominant inclusive end, is, so, sorry, so now we're asking a question of metaethics here. So the status of this highest good dominant end is guaranteed by either the basic structure of reality, the metaphysical picture of the world perhaps, or maybe by human nature. But in either case, built into our nature was this idea of a dominant end as natural and appropriate for all of us to aim at. So the basic picture here is teleological. Now I need to worry just for a second about this word teleological, which means something like end-directed. Um, because later on in the course, I'm going to use it in a slightly different way. So here, by a, talking about a teleological metaphysics, I mean something like this. A picture of the world in which, at its most fundamental level, objects have natural and appropriate goals and ends. Things are assumed to work naturally and properly toward their end. So the telos, the end or the goal, classically of an acorn, is to grow into an oak tree. So the goal is built into that object. Um, and when the acorn functions properly, it actually achieves its end. It actually achieves its goal. If it's defective in some way or gets squashed, it fails to achieve its goal, its end, its function, or its purpose. Okay, so this same teleological metaphysics applies to human beings too. We also have an inbuilt, so to speak, goal or end, or telos, 
that we are properly trying to achieve, and that's the good life. Ethical theory is the investigation of that. Ethical theory is the investigation of the highest good toward which we are all either actually or should be aiming. So notice that this means that, sorry, that this does not mean that everybody actually achieves it. Just like some acorns get squashed and fail to become oak trees, so too some people for either their own, based on their own defects or maybe based on uh, circumstances beyond their control, fail to achieve their good. Some people don't live good lives. Um, okay, and I guess I should emphasize one more time that all of this is a perfectly objective matter. If you, on this page, if you um, uh, are mistaken about what, you, uh, what goals you should be aiming at, well, that's your mistake. The goals, the telos, the highest good, what is valuable is an objective thing that we're making a mistake about if we are not aiming at or um, okay. Questions about that picture? I mean, it's just the roughest sketch, obviously. Um, but here, the point is this. For all the reasons we've been talking about, by the 17th century, this worldview was being upset. This teleological, metaphysical picture was being challenged. So think first about the rise of modern science. Modern science develops a worldview that does not have a teleological metaphysics. Modern science, think about like modern physics, for example, um, has a picture of the world in which the acorn doesn't grow up into an oak tree because that's its good. The acorn grows up into the oak tree because of some molecular process that um, Modern science describes the causal mechanisms that lead to that. Um, so the modern scientific picture emphasizes what's sometimes called efficient causality, one thing causing another to happen, rather than what's sometimes called final causality, where something is caused because of its goal to the logic. Um, and this has, so this rejection of the teleological metaphysics um, has um, two important consequences for us. First is, it presses the question of metaphysics in a new way. Um, it's just not clear. So, with a teleological view, it's it is clear how values fit into the world. It's clear where the good lies, so to speak, namely in achieving those natural ends. But with the modern scientific picture, with just one thing causing another, it's not clear whether there's room for objective values at all. It's also not clear whether there's room for freedom so the metaphysical status of values and freedom, morality, are all put into question by the rise of this modern science. And this is something that this meta-ethical picture question about the status of values in a scientific world, this is a question that all three of our authors are going to be explicitly concerned with directly. But there's another important implication, and that's this. Is the last, last one. Um, so the metaphysical status of values. Last point is this. Um, 
if our goals and our ends, and our goods, are not given to us by nature or by metaphysics, well, we really can't assume that there's going to be any kind of natural harmony or natural agreement among them. They're just, there's just no assumption that, for example, different people's goods, different people's goals, will be compatible with one another. Because it's no longer metaphysically guaranteed. It's no longer metaphysically sure. And now, at this period of time, this was not just a bare philosophical possibility. The possibility of different people's goods and values and goals sharply conflicting with one another was very, very real. It was lived out every day in the wars of religion that I just mentioned. Um, so not only did modern ethical theory have to investigate the nature of the good there was now a new question, a new problem that ethical theory investigated um, in earnest. Maybe even a more pressing or more, more urgent problem than the nature of the world. And that was whether people who have different goals and different goods can live together whether people who have different ends and different goals and different goods can live together under shared and common principles. And this is, if there are conflicting goods, whether they can be reconciled. And this, so, one more time. So the first question, the traditional question, was what's the good? This new question is, is there a way to reconcile or be fair to different individuals with different goods? And this question is the modern question of justice. So the virtue of justice assumes that there are going to be different goals and different goods that will conflict, and then it asks whether they can be reconciled or peacefully adjudicated um, without assuming that there's just one good or way of life that's the best. Um, okay, so... Um, this is all background, especially to how Hobbes addresses um, ethical, uh, uh, ethical problems, ethical questions. Um, you'll see that for him, the question of justice, rather than the question of the objective nature of the good life, is the central question that he's going to address. And so for Friday, uh, same readings that I mentioned uh, last time. Don't forget to get your clickers by Friday. Don't forget to register them by Friday. We'll have a kind of test.